Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Congress party has come up with its manifesto of full 48 pages. A well written, well drafted and well presented manifesto and like all political manifestos, it promises the voter the moon and also works on the presumption that they are coming to power. Every political party works on the presumption that they are coming to power before elections. Never mind what the opinion polls are saying or their track record is or their current strength is or also if even if the opponent or the or the incumbent seems to have a lot more of a head start. It doesn't matter. Every political party, when they come, <laughs> come up with a proposition before the voters, they, they, they work on the presumption that they are going to win because a manifesto is an offer, an offer of what they will do for the voters if they win power. However, in a democracy, even when a leading party does not win power, what it promises does several things. One, it, it influences the other party, even if the other party is ahead in the race. It influences them, particularly if the other party's manifesto is not yet out, because then the other party also gets a chance to look at what the challenger has offered and the challenger always carries weight. The challenger's promises always carry weight. So let us see if some of this also gets reflected in the BJP's manifesto. There the relative power of the two parties doesn't work. The second thing it does is it also re helps reset your national politics because the national politics in India has never been left or right. Uh, it's always been unipolar. There's been one dominant party. It was the Congress in the past or the Gandhi family, Congress slash Gandhi family. Now for the past 10 years, it's been BJP slash Narendra Modi. And looks like we are in a BJP Narendra Modi epoch now. So it's still unipolar with BJP Narendra Modi. The important thing to see is where is the Congress party moving now? Because the movements that Congress party makes or the moves that Congress party makes ideologically and also on, on some of the principal issues might also reflect in what the BJP does. And we look at areas of change. A lot of the manifestos, a lot of what is there in all manifestos is really motherhood and apple pie. It's all nice things that parties promise. But we look for changes. Now, if we see this 48 page Congress manifesto, and I will share a link with you. You can read the entire manifesto if you so wish. If you want to see change, then there are important changes. I see important changes from, from national security to, to mining to economic policy. And I will just list a few for you very quickly. Number one, national security. There is a big correction in the Congress view on national security, particularly internal security compared to what it was in 2019. 2019 Congress manifesto was what you might call an ultra liberal manifesto. I would have called it, called it a, a liberal college kids kind of manifesto on national security because it talked about abolition of armed forces, special powers act. It talked about repealing of sedition law. All of these things the Congress party had not done when they were in power for 10 years. If anything, they had made UAPA much more tough under their under their rule while they abolished POTA, which was which was one of the conditions on the common minimum program when the UPA government was being set up. So first of all, the Congress did not sound so convincing. And second, certainly India wasn't re ready for that kind of an ultra liberal view on national security. Congress party has now made a complete departure from that. It has made complete departure, correction you might call it. And you might then say the Congress party is lifted from the left ideologically to the center. Although sometimes it's not very easy to define what is left and what is right when it comes to national security, global affairs, and the economy because or, or, or society because sometimes these things have dodgy definitions. Nevertheless, for ease of analysis, we'd say the Congress party has shifted from the left 
to the center. The fact is the Congress party never had a quote unquote liberal view on national security. Congress party had traditionally been tough on national security. It's in the last manifesto that, that they seem to take that college politics line, college union line. Also under UPA too, it had looked like the Congress party had weakened or softened its, its stand on national security. That's not been, that's not been corrected. This manifesto is big on national security. In fact, it's talking about reviving and strengthening the two organizations that UPA had promised to set up. UPA had promised to set up after 2611 and that was still UPA1 and that is NatGrid and also NCTC. NCTC is National Counterterrorism Center. What was these organizations meant to do? NatGrid was supposed to be the repository of all data from bank accounts, tax filings, tax data, tax departments, immigration data. It was supposed to be the repository of all these data and all these data would then be, all of this database would then be analyzed and made available to all the security agencies, basically to help fight against terrorism. So NatGrid had been more or less moribund. It had started. It did not grow under UPA because by, by the time UPA 2 came in, that government, as I told you just a minute back, softened its stand on internal security. Part, partly because of the view that was coming in from the National Advisory Committee of Sonia Gandhi's. The other organization, NCTC, it never got going. So NCTC was a big idea. Remember, Americans also have something called NCTC, which is National Counterterrorism Center. That was stillborn. Nothing happened. In fact, today it's not even an office. So the Congress says they come back, they will, they will build NatGrid to its real power or to its real potential and they will revive NCTC. So this becomes a real organization. NetGrid, by the way, after having been moribund for quite some time under NDA 1 or under Modi 1, has now picked up some steam. So on 3rd May 2022, Home Minister Amit Shah inaugurated NetGrid's Data Recovery Center, right? That's what it's called, NetGrid Data Recovery Center in Bengaluru that is supposed to be collecting all of this data, a lot of this data. So that organization is now moving. That organization is not dead or stillborn as NCTC was. But the Congress says if they come to power, they will accelerate its growth. That's a big, that's a big shift in Congress's policy. Again, if you see on environment and the economy. So environment, I'm not going into a lot of detail, but if you go back to UPA 1 and 2, in both UPA 1 and 2, it looked like mining was a bad word. Mining was a bad word. There were mining bans everywhere. There were go and no go, go and no go areas, large areas, large swaths of land, which were rich in minerals. They were declared to be no-go zones. We also remember how Rahul Gandhi went to Od Odisha in Niamgiri and stopped the mining for bauxite there. So there was a lot of action against mining. Mining was seen as a dirty activity under UPA 1 and even more so under UPA 2. And that was one of the reasons the economy suffered at that time because Indian mining had no advocate in UPA 2. By that time also there were scandals with some mining lease allocations particularly with coal. So mining went into a deep freeze and an impression grew and I think quite rightly that the ideological thinking around UPA, particularly around the Congress party, was hostile to mining or was suspicious to mining. Maybe hostile is a strong word. Suspicious of mining. That has now been corrected and how? So this manifesto says that not only with the Congress, if it comes to power, focus on mining, encourage mining, particularly mining in critical minerals. Remember, that is the most important thing right now because if everybody is going into electric vehicles, electric this, electric that, and alternative sources of energy, then you need these rare minerals. If you want semiconduct semiconductors, if you want anything high tech, you need rare minerals. So Congress says they will focus on that and they even say that they will take mining to up to 5% of the GDP. So imagine the Congress is now talking about taking mining to 5% of GDP. 
Currently, it's about 1.8%, 1.9% of India's GDP. That means tripling your mining output. That's a big promise and that is in some ways un-Congress-like if you go by Congress party's record of its 10 years in power between 2004 and 2014. Enhanced mining activity, they say, will provide jobs to 1.5 crore people. Mining is back in fashion with the Congress party. Good news. Old pension scheme. Now we've seen state after state after state, Congress party has been promising to restore the old pension scheme, which you, if you ask me, and this is opinion now, is a very bad idea. Because moving on to the new pension scheme was among the biggest reforms carried, carried out in India. And this was a bipartisan reform, but it was carried out both the BJP-led NDA government at that point and the Congress party. They were all in agreement with this and Congress party also continued on with the scheme. Now, in some state elections, Congress party promised to go back. It was Rajasthan, it was Karnataka, and it's a work in progress in those states. And I understand that there was quite a bit of deba debate within the Congress party with some people, some pow powerful people insisting that in the National Manifesto also, Congress made a commitment to OPS, but that has not happened, which is again, again a welcome thing and which again shows a shift from the left towards the center for the Congress party. Because remember, classically, Congress party was always a centrist party. There is praise for private sector, which in the past also we might have seen some, but in this case now, the praise is quite enhanced. And they also say private sector is the main provider of jobs in the country. That's all categories, that is minor and small industries, and also large industries, all categories of industries. And, and the manifesto promises, tax credits for employers in the private sector who hire more people. There is, of course, there is, of course, the big promise of doubling India's GDP in the next 10 years. How does, how would, what growth rate will be required for India's GDP to double in the next 10 years? So if you, if you just Google or if you've been, if, if, if you, if you were taught how to calculate compound interest, maybe in class five or six math. I don't know now, different kind of math is taught. But then when you were taught, you were taught the principle or rule of 72. The rule of 72 is that you divide the figure of 72 by the interest rate, compound interest rate you are going to get. And then you get the number of years in which that amount will double. So divide 72 by what? Divide 72 by 7.2 and you will see that in 10 years, your value will double. So whether it's your borrowing or it's your national wealth, it's your national GDP, for it to double in 10 years, it has to grow at 7.2%, obviously compounded. Now, some comparisons are in order here. From where do, where do we get here? Because you might say that we will double it in, in, in 10 years. What's happened in the past is important because that's what the Congress is talking about. The Congress says that between 1991 and 2003, in 13 years, India's GDP doubled. And these figures are in rupees and they are in constant rupees in the 1991 value. We have to be careful. So in 1991, India's GDP was 25 lakh crore. In the next 13 years, it took it the next 13 years up to 2003, 2004 to become 50 lakh crore. So it took 13 years to double from 1991. 50 lakh crores again in 1991 rupee value. I have to keep emphasizing it again and again. When did the next doubling took place? The next doubling took place in 10 years. So in the next 10 years, that is between 2003-04 and 2013-14, what was 50 lakh crores became 100 lakh crores in the 1991 rupee value. So the Congress says, that this BJP government inherited an economy of the size of 100 lakh crore. What has happened under this government? The Congress party argues that under this government in the next 10 years, that is between 2013-14 to 2023-24, which is a year that just ended financially, or that just ended, India's economy has become the size of 173 lakh crore. So Modi government has missed the target of doubling the economy's size every 10 years. And they promise that they are going to correct it. Now, we also did some other calculations because sometimes calculations are fun and they also yield interesting figures that if 
Congress party keeps its promise and this doubles its value in 1991 rupee value by the way. Then this size of this economy doubles in the next 10 years. That means 2033-34. What will be the size of India's economy? If you calculate on the basis of what the value of the dollar was in 1991. And remember 1991 is also a year when the rupee was devalued a little bit. Then it will come to 15.2 trillion dollars. That is about the size of China's economy right now. Now 10 years from now can you get there? I don't know. Right now we've been promised a 5 trillion dollar economy in the next 3 years ought to be the third largest economy in the world in the next three or four years. But this, so if anything, this is quite an ambitious promise. How will the Congress get there? The Congress will get there because they say they will make tax rates moderate and constant. So income tax rates, they say, will remain constant in their term, which means all salaried people know what taxation will be. The next thing they are saying is that to improve the finances of the states, they will limit the cesses that the center can charge on taxes to 5%. Now 5% to try to, to understand this better, we have to see what is it that the center now charges or that the center now collects as cess. <laughs> if we see the current year's budget, then my colleague TCA Sharad Raghavan, who's also our economics editor, he tells me that at this point, the center's tax kitty says or cesses amount to 22%, which means the center will get, center's kitty will be cut by this much and this money will go directly to the states. And that's how Congress party thinks. It will also help federalism plus bring fiscal discipline at the central level. Now you talk about fiscal discipline and then uh, it takes me to the other part of the manifesto, which is which is the rights side. Now welfareist side. So the Congress party also has taken a leaf out of Narendra Modi's book. So they are also looking for catchy phrases, alliterations, formulae, acronyms. So they've chosen three W's, right? Work, wealth, welfare. Prime Minister Modi, for example, has a D's, democracy, demography, diversity, demand, etc. Congress party has picked up three W's, work, wealth, welfare. Now, when we look at the social side or the welfareist side of this manifesto. So once again, an important point is that the Congress party is now talking about something like a uniform civil code. There is not an immediate instinctive rejection because it's the BJP's idea, except the Congress party does not use the expression uniform civil code. The Congress party spokesperson at the manifesto presentation, Praveen Chakravarti said, we don't like the expression uniform civil code. They would rather prefer a common civil law, but they say they will do it in consultation with communities and not bring it top down, but they are talking about a common per common personal law, which they say will be equitable to women in particular. The other interesting thing they are talking about on the social side, and that's going to have a buzz and let us see how does the BGP manifesto respond to it. And you have to, uh, you have to let me speak maybe a little bit slowly because it's a bit complex. Today, our total reservations are limited to 50%. You can give it to whatever categories, but overall reservation cannot go above 50%. Now, Modi government also added 10% reservation for economically weaker sections. That 10% economically weaker sections is limited to upper castes or castes which are or groups which are not yet covered by reservations, which means not scheduled castes, not scheduled tribes and not OBCs. So, any of the upper castes, most, mostly the upper castes. This 10% economically weaker section EWS quota is limited to upper castes. So what is the Congress saying? Congress say, is saying, first of all, they'll amend the constitution to take away this 50% cap. And I'll tell you what, anybody, doesn't matter whose government it is, if such an amendment is moved, you will probably have this amendment go through unanimously because nobody would dare to oppose it. So any party that comes to power can do it. The important thing they are saying is, the important thing they are saying is that this 10% EWS quota will no longer be confined to those 
not covered by other reservations which means this ews quota will also be available to people from scheduled caste stripes and other backward castes this will have an immediate buzz and let us see how the bjp responds to it because the bjp counts the upper castes as, as its most committed and most ossified vote bank so if this is an appeal to that vote bank the bjp might have to respond to it where there is not that much clutter i mean i will just mention to you that as you would expect the congress party is promising a lot of rights to people so there is a right to apprenticeship that there is a right to urban employment there is a right to homestead they want to raise minimum wages to 400 rupees at least minimum minimum wages by the way vary in the country right now in haryana right now it's the highest Moshmi Das Gupta, my senior colleague who who covers the government, tells me in Haryana it's three hundred seventy four rupees, the highest in the country. So so it's almost four hundred rupees. It is low in Bihar, two hundred and ten rupees, as you would expect. UP is two thirty seven. Again, not such a big surprise. And Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh also low, two hundred twenty one. And these are areas where the bulk of the bjp's votes and seats come from so in these areas congress party is promising to nearly double the minimum wages in fact i can count the other rights based things but but some of those you would expect from a congress manifesto i would just say that the word rights has been used 40 times 40 40 times in a 48 page manifesto there are other interesting ideas for example a one time total loan waiver for all educational loans because they say there is unemployment so students are not able to repay their loans now we look at the data how much is that amount that amount is about 1 lakh 18000 crores once again i'd say nobody can stop a bad economic idea whose time has come loan waivers are never a good idea and justification will be found oh you are giving loan write offs to corporates this and that etc you you are giving so many loan waivers to farmers so why not to students so as i say nobody can stop a bad idea bad economic idea whose time has come so i won't be surprised if this idea is also followed by maybe the bjp or maybe some of the state governments but this idea has wheels and some fuel so you will you will see it go some distance for sure as you would expect there is the promise of a socio economic caste census restoration of statehood for jammu and kashmir also the firing the dismissal of the manipur government and some kind of a reconciliation commission to bring the cookies and methis together So thereabouts is my larger understanding of the Congress manifesto how it's different from the Congress positions on key issues in the past how much distance have have they traveled i would say the distance they've traveled is mostly from the left to the right congress was always a centrist party they've now carried out some correction maybe a bit late in the day for them if if they had done it in 2019 or if they had not gone this way 2009 onwards maybe they would not be in as bad a state as they are in but ultimately sawari apni saman ki khud zimmedar hoti as as we say or or a traveler is responsible for their own baggage right so a political party is also responsible for its own fate having said that there are some interesting shifts and changes there and let us now watch how the bjp responds because whatever the bjp does and whatever the bjp might say they do not not take the congress party seriously bjp has not become the number one party by such a long distance and bjp does not have such a humongous head start in this campaign or in the prospects of 2024 also because they take their rivals lightly they take the, their rivals very seriously and let's see if they respond to some of these points